being welcomed. We'd like to welcome you all here today, whether you're online or in the sanctuary. If you're visiting with us, please take a card from the pew in front of you and then turn it in the offering plate when they're passed today. Today is the first official day of spring. I'm so excited. That means warmer weather. Don't forget, we have suppers on Wednesday night from 5 to 6. You need to sign up in the hallway. And this week's supper is going to be Santa Fe stew. At 6.30, we will have all of our activities for everybody. We have one more week in March for the kids and everybody else to remember the memory verse. That memory verse is Ecclesiastes 4.9. So everybody get to working on it this week to memorize it. April 3rd, we will have our youth fundraiser luncheon. That's right, it's going to be baked spaghetti with a salad. And all the proceeds are going to help the youth go to camp this summer at Ridgecrest. April 9th is our kids' Easter egg hunt. We're still in need of some candy. If you'd like to donate, please put it in the bucket in the fellowship hall. Don't forget to invite all the kids you know because it's going to be a lot of fun. We also need some volunteers to help hide the eggs. So sign up in the hallway if you can be here about 8.30 on April 9th. Easter will be April 17th, and we will have a sunrise service at the gazebo. That's right. It's going to be at 7.30. You might want to bring a chair and maybe a blanket. Sometimes it's a little cool. And then we're going to have our regular service at 10.30, but no Sunday school that day. We will have a new members class starting the Sunday after Easter. And it will go for several weeks. It's going to be during the Sunday school hour. If you'd like more information, please talk to Pastor Jonathan. We hope y'all have a great day of worshiping here with us at Kingsley Lake. And don't forget, you can watch us again on Facebook and YouTube. Well, good morning. It's good to see you all. I invite you to stand with me as we begin our time of worship. The cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood. So sweetly abides within There at the cross where he took me in Glory to his name Glory to his name Glory to his name There to my heart was the blood of It's so good to have you here with us today. In case you are wondering, uh, our worship leader, Brother Paul, is on vacation this week with his family for spring break. So I'm pulling double duty today. <laughs> but uh, listen, it's so good to have you here as we worship together. We're going to sing another song before um, uh, Brother Ryan comes up and uh, says a word to us. This next song is called Graves into Gardens. And, you know, we think about the heart and the message of this song. You know, we live in a world that is just marred with sin. We see it all around us. We see the effects of sin. We feel the brokenness of a world in desperate need of a fix. And the good news of the gospel, the reason that we are here today is because God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You see, the gospel is good news that heaven reached down. God reached down through his son to pay the price that we owed. And through, through a decision of faith, the trust in our resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we're made new. Amen, church? We're made new, and the Lord breathes a new life into us, and we can walk with him. Uh, we're going to sing this song, Graves and Gardens. I invite you to worship with me. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise, treasures that fade are never enough. Oh, then you came along and put me back together. Desire is now satisfied hearing your love, oh, your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing and nothing is better than you. you still call me friend cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's no
way we can have a record of your uh, of, of your time with us, but also find out a way we can reach out to you or any way we can be praying for you. Um, glad to have you this morning. Uh, teachers, Bradford Union County Spring Break, you made it. You made it through uh, um, Full Moon Week and St. Patrick's Week, so congratulations. Clay County teachers, best of luck. I'm going back. <laughs> going you back in the fire this week, so good luck with that. Um, just a couple of things real quick. I wanted to show you right up front. Uh, if you saw this coming in, it's the Say Yes campaign. It's still going on. Um, still looking for uh, li lots of little kids. We got lots of little kids from zero all the way to like, um, I guess fifth grade is a cutoff before youth, but I could take youth workers too. So you know, sixth, sixth to twelfth grade. Any kid looking for lots of workers. Uh, but if you have an opportunity, if you want to check that out, there's a lot of positions still available that we could use just help, you know, help on, whether it's leading or teaching or just helping uh, and serving alongside our, our leaders. We'll be glad to have you. Um, but yeah, and so, and one other thing, next uh, two Sundays, we're going to have a youth fundraiser. Uh, it's going to be a baked spaghetti luncheon right after church. Um, I love baked spaghetti, so it's like, it's a win. We're going to do baked spaghetti and salad that day for you guys after church. That's going to be donations for, basically all donations will go towards helping our youth go to summer camp. And right now, I'm happy to say we have only one spot left. So we've, we've packed out the whole... <coughs> Whole bus almost, but we got one, one bus seat available going to Ridgecrest, North Carolina. So uh, we'll keep praying for that and hopefully the right youth fills that position. So um, this morning, though, as we continue with worship, I just wanted to uh, kind of take time to, uh, I was going through my quiet time this morning, and I do a little devotional most mornings from Alistair Begg. And this morning, it was really challenging me. I really thought about it because we have a lot of things to be thankful for. I mean, this beautiful morning we have, just there's so many good graces that we see on a daily basis. Food, shelter. We live in America. We have freedom. There's a lot of really good things we have. And those are just general grace that we, we, we have reason to be thankful for. But uh, he was, the, the challenge was to take time to remember the gracious thankfulness we should have. And what that means is we have so much to be thankful for as believers. We can only understand this as believers, as the church. And we come together and we, you know, we worship on Sunday mornings and uh, we reflect on the gospel. And we have so much to be thankful for because of who we are in Christ, you know. Uh, this week I was reading stories of Ukrainian Christians uh, in, the, uh, in Ukraine. I didn't realize, I was blown away by this, but Ukraine is, they consider it the Bible Belt of Eastern Europe. Uh, there's so much that God has been doing in Ukraine. So it's interesting when you see the, the world scale, what's going on, like why Ukraine is under so much attack. And I think you got to pull the veil back to spiritual warfare still. I mean, it's still good versus evil and and there's so much happening there. But when you read the stories of the believers in Ukraine, they're still being the church in the midst of this. And they have this thankfulness, this, this depth of gratitude that comes not just from the good grace that God gives us, but because of who they are in Christ. And so for us, that's to be a challenge for us to continually reflect on because of the gospel, because of Jesus' life, death, resurrection. We have so much to be thankful for. And uh, we have reason to worship this morning. So I pray as we worship, we would just take time to set aside the distractions, just reflect on how good our God is and what he has done for us and how we can continue sharing that with our community. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for uh, just the opportunity to be with our faith family here this morning, Lord God, and just a beautiful Sunday morning. And I pray, Lord, that we will, uh, as we worship you, Lord God, we would just set aside the distractions of, of this world and, God, things that are going on just so we can hear from you this morning, Lord God. We want to hear from you. And I pray, Lord, you'll speak to our hearts. Prepare Jonathan's heart as he, as he speaks to us in front of God. Give him the words to say. And help our hearts just to be attentive to your word as we reflect on the gospel and who you are and what you've done for us, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. When the sun sets free, oh, it's free in me. Now my debt. Wonderful 
Father, we are here today to worship your good and perfect and holy name, the name that is above every name, your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we have, Lord, to gather together as a people free to worship a people free from bondage and slavery to sin, a people redeemed through the blood of the Lamb. Lord, may we never forget that price that was paid for our freedom. May we never forget, Lord, why we live and why we exist. Lord, to honor you, to worship you in all that we do, in our song, in our life, our work, and all that we are, Lord, may it be a beautiful song of praise to you. And Father, now as we prepare to give, Lord, of uh, the blessings that you have so richly poured out upon us, we thank you, Father, for how you provide. We thank you for, Lord, how uh, you are able to take what little we have, Lord, and multiply it and to do great and awesome things with it. And so today, Father, we come to you acknowledging that you are God, that all that we have is yours, and we give back to you, Lord. Pray that you would help us as a church to be faithful, as good stewards, uh, Lord, of uh, the offerings that are given, but even more so, Lord, may we be good stewards of the good news of the gospel, your son, Jesus Christ. In your name I pray, amen. We're going to be studying out of Luke chapter 10. You know, several years ago, uh, I reckon, Shannon, it must have been uh, 12 or more years. Well, it's probably been a lot longer than that. Uh, many years ago, the Lord called us to a new church. And, you know, when you go into a new place, there's so much that you have to discover. Sometimes I, I, I found that it, it feels like things are happening so fast that uh, you don't get to look through, you know, turn, turn over every rock and see everything that's happening around. But we just kind of moved into this church parsonage. This is my last church out in Live Oak, Florida. It was kind of a, a fast move. We didn't really have a chance to drive around and see the whole community. I'll never forget that first night, Shannon. So here we were, we were in our house, we were putting our little children down. Uh, Brooke was just a little baby, Caleb was a, a, a small little boy. We put them down and we're headed to, uh, to bed, it was about 10.30 at night. And as we lay down, we started hearing this thump. Doom, 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 doom. And I'm like, look at her, what is that? And then is, suddenly you start hearing hooping and the hollering and you realize there is a party that is happening near us. And before we knew it, we heard someone coming over the loudspeaker. All right, ladies and gentlemen, stand up, grab a partner, get on the floor, and do si do. I looked at, we looked at each other with shock on our face and said, we moved in next to a honky-tonk. <laughs> this is how life is going to be. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> 
Uh, the good news, uh, we woke up the next morning and I drove the other direction that we had yet to drive in. It wasn't a honky-tonk, it was the county fair, and they were having the line dance night. And so uh, it was one night, but uh, it was a fun time. To say we overreacted was an understatement. We were laying in bed already thinking about getting out of that parsonage and moving away from those rowdy neighbors next door. <laughs> well, this morning as we continue in our study, last week we looked at the Great Commission. We studied uh, those famous words from Jesus, which is the commission of the church, the commission of every born-again child of God. We kind of broke down the Great Commission, and, and, the, and moving forward in these next few weeks, we're going to begin to see how the Great Commission is lived out in everyday life. And so today we, we turn our attention to reaching our neighbors for Jesus, reaching our neighbors for Jesus. You know, in doing so, there's a par parable that is perhaps one of Jesus' most well-known parables that we're going to study today that I believe can teach us a lot about who a neighbor is, but even more than who a neighbor is, how we are to neighbor others. Read with me, beginning in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, that is Jesus, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, that lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Will you pray with me as we consider this question? Father God, we again thank you for the privilege to gather together. We thank you for your word, which is your truths. And I pray that today, uh, Lord, that you would open our hearts. Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, you would speak your truth into our lives. Uh, Lord, we look out into this world and we see a world so full of darkness. A world that is, uh, Lord, suffering and struggling under the weight of sin and brokenness. And Lord, we believe that through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have answered the greatest need of this world. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the life that we can live through him. And I pray that today as we continue this discussion of the Great Commission, how it's lived out in our life, Lord, may we all grow as the neighbors you desire us to be. As in your name I pray, amen. What comes to your mind when you hear that word, neighbor? You know, most would identify their neighbor as the person living next door or very nearby. But for the Jews in Jesus' day, uh, they view their neighbor as their fellow Israelites, uh, those within the covenant relationship with God. It certainly is, to an extent, a broader understanding of what many today would consider a neighbor, but yet still far more narrow than what the Lord would have us to believe. And so Jesus was about to expose this man's heart through this story of the Good Samaritan. And he'll teach us some lessons along the way. So read with me. We're going to continue uh, and kind of just uh, discuss as we go along. Look at verse 30. It says, Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. So we see the first of four characters uh, in this parable. And it was this man. He was an unnamed man. Remember, this is a parable. It was not a real-life story. It was a story that Jesus uh, was sharing to convey a point. Uh, and so we see this man that Jesus is bringing out who really represents those in this world who are in a place of need. This man was stripped of everything that he had. He was beaten and he was left for dead. You could say this man was a victim of a vicious crime, and he was in desperate need of help. Verse 31 tells us, Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now what are you thinking when you see a priest and soon to be a Levite walking down the road? This is the person that I need to help, right? Outside of a doctor, surely this is the person that could stop. 
and help me out. This was a religious man, a priest. He was likely on his way home uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho after serving a long day in the temple. Surely if anyone was to have compassion, this would be the man. But we read that he saw him and he passed by on the other side. But then it came another man, verse 32. So likewise, the Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Another religious man. You know, some would say, well, what's the difference with a priest and a Levite? Uh, I, I, I'll be brief here. Really, a priest in their duties, they were responsible for officiating the temple sacrifices. Where the Levites were, uh, they served as helpers and assistants within the temple. Both of these men were religious men. We could call both of them clergymen. Yet both of them, seeing this need before them, just passed on by. You know, what do we make of that? I think it's easy for us to look on these two uh, supposedly godly men and question how they couldn't have compassion in their hearts, how they could walk by somebody in such great need. But I remind you that far too often we are in their very shoes, aren't we? Uh, Peter tells us that we are a royal priesthood. Church, I remind you that as a people of God, we are all enrolled in the service of God. Amen? And so we are a royal priesthood, and we too, throughout our lives, come across people, uh, maybe not physically beaten and stripped in the ditches of life, but we come across people in great and dire need. But how often do we walk right by? You know, I thought about why. Why would they just walk right by? There's certainly a lot of excuses that one could come up with. Perhaps they thought, I've worked all day, I'm tired, I just need a break. I've checked out, checked out. I've clocked out, I'm off the clock, this is my time off, I don't want to be bothered. Perhaps they thought, I'm in a hurry. You know, they may have said that whoever robbed that man surely isn't too far behind, it's too dangerous, I need to press ahead. Maybe they thought, well, you know, what do I have to offer? I'm not a doctor, someone else will come and help out. I think there's another, another thing that was at play here, another factor. You see, their jobs in the temple service required them to remain uh, ceremonially clean while on duty. There were certain things that they just simply weren't allowed to do that would defile them. They were not allowed to touch a dead body or any bodily fluid for that matter. You know, this very well could have been the driving factor, but I think it really exposes a problem in their hearts they were more concerned with adhering to a list of rules and demands uh, than they were on meeting the needs of others around them. You know, as Jesus walked this earth, he was confronted with many of these religious people, wasn't he? Many of the religious leaders of the day. And, and many of them confronted him about the works and the healing and things that he was doing. And it exposes this problem. They're more concerned about a list of do's and don'ts than they are the very heart of God. They missed the whole point, didn't they? In the process of their duties, they missed what God had really called them to do. Whatever the reason, they just passed by. But then enters a surprising character. We see the good Samaritan. Look at verse 33. But a, a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. You know, I can only imagine these religious leaders, this lawyer, who at that time the lawyer was a religious expert in the law. This was a religious man. This was a shocking statement. You know, if you were to ask them which of these uh, three passerbys would have been the one to stop, surely they would never have chosen the Samaritan. The fact that Jesus uh, shared this it was, is, is important, is significant to us because the Jews, they looked at Samaritans as uh, outsiders. They looked at them as these half-breeds who intermarried. Uh, they looked at them as lower than their very own slaves. You know, the Jews, they literally prayed that God wouldn't hear the prayers of the Samaritans. 
they literally pray that God would not forgive their sin. Oh, that's some special kind of hate, isn't it? There was a real hatred and a real rivalry between these. Why then did Jesus choose a Samaritan to, to drive home this point? Was it for effect? I think it's quite clear. Jesus was teaching them some very important lessons here. So I want you to follow with me. If you got a pen and you're taking notes, uh, the first thought I want to share with you, the parable of the Good Samaritan teaches us the heart of God to the nations. The parable of the Good Samaritan teaches us the heart of God to the nations. Jesus challenges our narrow view of who we are to love. And that really was the problem at point for this, this young lawyer, this man who put Jesus to the test. He wasn't concerned with, with really who his neighbor was, but rather who he had to love and who he did not have to love. And, and so in their time, again, it goes back to this thought that you were either one of us or you were not. You are part of the covenant family or you're outside of it. They didn't look at the gospel as this inclusive gift of God for any who would come to him in faith. They view themselves as a special people of God and God's love to be reserved for themselves. But Jesus was making very clear who we are to love. He was making it clear that God's love is not limited to their national view, but every man, child, woman, regardless of your nationality, regardless of your ethnicity, your social or economical status, uh, you are of great worth and value to God. I love John 3, 16, that verse we know so well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus defines the scope of our mission, church. We, as a people of God, are to be reaching out to the whoever's of this world. Those who seem to have their act together, those who seem so far from God. We're to reach out to those who, who obviously are, are, are down and out in life. We're to reach out to those who are wrestling in the mire, in the pit of sin, in brokenness. We're to reach out to the outcasts of society. We're to reach out to those who look like us, to those who don't look like us. The gospel is good news for all, that Jesus came to seek and save the lost, that he offered his life a sacrifice, literally, quite literally, a substitute for our sins, so that through faith in his death, burial, and resurrection, we can have life and have it abundantly. That's the good news of the gospel. And that good news is for, who, for any who would come to him in faith. So Jesus here in this parable of the Good Samaritan was teaching the heart of God. He was trying to radically change, challenge their view and to show that, listen, I've come to seek and to save all. My love is for all. The, good, the parable of the Good Samaritan also teaches us, number two, the danger of a works-based religion. It teaches us the danger of a works-based religion. I want you to think about a works-based religion. And rather than being faith-based, we believe that we've all sinned. This is us. We believe that we have all sinned, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And because of our sins, we are separated from him. And there's nothing that we can do on our own uh, to, to, to bridge that gap because we have sinned. And God, being a just God, will punish sin. There is a price. Romans 6, 23, for the wage of sin is what, church? death. That's what we call the bad news of the gospel, but the good news is God demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, so what do we see here? Uh, we see that uh, we are saved through faith and through faith alone, but there were some and there are some still today that we make it about what we have done. You know, your faith and your religion becomes a list of do's and don'ts. And that certainly had become the issue of the day with many of the religious leaders. Think about the danger of works-based religion. Works-based religion produces pride. It produces pride. Jesus was speaking to a religiously proud man. He wasn't concerned with the truth. He was concerned with looking good before his peers and before others, of justifying himself, as Jesus would say. He put in a lot of effort on the exterior at the expense of the in, excuse me at the expense of the interior, uh, which is where real change takes place. 
Works-based religion produces pride. It, uh, it exalts self. It makes it more about me and less about him. It makes it about what I've accomplished, my goodness. The problem is this. I love what Isaiah says in chapter 64. We have all become like one who is unclean. And here this church, and all our righteous deeds are as a polluted garment. You may have read the uh, translation as filthy rags. Man, this is a terribly, you know, not a very good picture. Polluted garment, it really speaks of one's undergarments. Think about that. He's saying all your righteous deeds, all your good efforts, well, they really fall short before a perfect and holy and a righteous God because we have all sinned. All of our hearts have turned away. There are no, none good, no, not one. You see, works-based religion is dangerous because it misses the mark. It misses the mark. Jesus was speaking to a religiously lost man, a man who had the appearance of godliness. He may have fooled quite a few around him, but he didn't fool the Lord. You know, when we look to the Scripture, I think it's pretty clear that there are many in our day, and there will be many that day of judgment when they stand before the throne or uh, the judgment seat of Christ. There's going to be many who have been living a lie. Many who will come saying, Lord, Lord. Even many who prophesied in the name of Jesus, yet their hearts were far from God. Many who may have had this appearance of religion, but they were lost. See, works-based religion is dangerous because it gives us a false sense of security. They thought they were good. They thought it had together, but they were lost. Ephesians 5.8 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So here's the truth, church. Our works for God, it's, it is not the means to salvation. It's the fruit of what Jesus is doing in our life. Listen, we, we were created for good works, weren't we? We were created to serve God and do good things. Listen, it's good to do much of what they were doing. It's good to serve God. It's good to, to be a blessing to other people. But if we look at all those uh, rituals and if we look at our work as a means to, to get the approval of God, we miss the mark. But when I give my heart to Jesus and I trust in him, realizing there's nothing good in me, I have sinned against a holy God. I have fallen short. When I give my heart to him, he does a work in my life, doesn't he? He's transforming me, and he's make, he's made, through Christ, I am made a new person. And the Holy Spirit is dwelling in my heart. And let me tell you, those works will be the fruit, the overflow of a life given to Christ. They will come naturally. But here was a man, and here was a man that represented these people who they put such attention to the outside at the expense of their hearts. Uh, number three, the parable of the Good Samaritan teaches us also, the potential of the transformed life. I believe that every life has potential. Aaron holding his son Grady, life is such a blessing, isn't it? Such an exciting thing. You know, you hold that little child and so many thoughts go through your mind. I'll never forget holding our firstborn son and then Brooke later on. And you hold that child and you just wonder, Lord, what will become of this child? Anybody ever have those moments just of you know, praying over that child. Lord, may, this, may he or may she grow into your image. May he, she be strong in her faith and trust in you as her Lord and Savior. I believe that life presents such potential. God created each of us. We are all created in his image as image bearers of the holy God. Sin breaks that, doesn't it? Sin distorts what God created to be a good thing. But listen, under the power of the gospel, the transformation that Jesus does in our life, God can do wonderful and powerful things. Life has potential. Through the perversion of sin, has the potential to do great harm, to do great evil in this world. We see a lot of that today, don't we? Ryan spoke of what's happening in Ukraine. No doubt, this is the work of evil and sinful man. This is uh, one of the terrible effects of the fall of sin in this world. But imagine what God can do when he gets hold of a heart. I hope that you're praying for, for those who are doing such evil. I hope that you're praying for, for Putin and, and, and the many who are, are pushing this agenda and this war. 
pray that God would redeem their hearts, that God would get a hold of them. Because, friends, the gospel is what can change a life. The gospel is what can change things and turn it around. When God gets a hold of your life, he can redeem all that potential for his glory. And I think when we look at the Good Samaritan, we see just that. He he represents the transformed life. Those who have passed from death to life through faith in Jesus. Those who have given their hearts to him. And they've been given a new heart and the Holy Spirit to dwell within them and to use them for his glory. The Good Samaritan shows us the potential to make a real difference in this world. To have a real kingdom impact. And fourth... The good, parable of the Good Samaritan shows us the discipline of neighboring. It teaches us the discipline of neighboring. Our story began with this question, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? But look how Jesus would wrap this up in verse 36 and 37. He says, which of these three? So he's looking at this lawyer, this man who, you know, it seemed like an innocent question. But his heart was far from God. He looks at him and says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Jesus wouldn't just challenge their notion of a neighbor. He would turn this question around. You know, rather than asking, who is my neighbor? What Jesus is saying is this. We should be asking, what kind of neighbor has God called me to be? That's the pertinent question to us today as we think about how the Great Commission plays out in everyday life. What kind of neighbor is God calling me to be? And so I see a couple of thoughts that we can glean from the Samaritan here. Uh, how to be a good neighbor. If you want to be a good neighbor, a neighbor that makes a difference, you need to put on your gospel glasses. You need to put on your gospel glasses. I think when we really grasp the gospel, it changes how I see things, doesn't it? It changes things. It changes my perspective. Think about this. The gospel informs me of a person's worth. We spent some time already talking about that. Uh, We know that because uh, of the good news of the gospel, because of God's gift of Jesus Christ, we know that every man, child, and woman was created in his image and created to know him, to walk with him. We understand that sin broke that. But God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's easy to say, I love you. It's another thing to actually love somebody. What the Good Samaritan teaches us is that real love is more than a word. It's more than a feeling. It is an action. It's moving from where we are and doing what we can. And so we see this, that we got to put on our gospel glasses. The gospel informs us of a person's worth. The gospel brings clarity to a person's brokenness. Years ago, I worked for a, a company called the White Foundation. And I was kind of like a probation, a juvenile probation officer, except I counseled with these kids. It's a diversion program. And it was just heartbreaking, some of the, some of the homes that you go into. You know, you go to court and you'd, see, you'd read some of their files and what had happened in their life, and you'd think, man, you know, this kid is just a mess. It's a train wreck of a life. You know, before working that job, I, could, I would often look out and I would just think, man, them knuckleheads, what are they doing, right? We look at them and we can kind of look with disgust at some of the ways that they act. But as I got in those homes, my heart was pierced. I learned that there is a story behind every broken situation. You go in some of those homes and you see the way they're treated, the way that they're talked to, how they're not valued we see is a lot of people are just acting from a place of brokenness. When I began to grasp the reality and the truth, the whole truth of the gospel, I began to see why things are the way they are in this world. There are people that are lost, like sheep without a shepherd, lost in darkness, searching for hope, searching for purpose, searching for more. Rather than looking at this world as the enemy, we need to understand they're the mission Friends, we can't reach a people we don't love. When I put on those gospel glasses, I begin to see the problem beneath the surface. I also see that the the gospel is the power of God to change a person's life. Those gospel glasses tell me, as I look out, why things are the way they are, and it tells me the fix that they need. 
it reminds me that Jesus is the answer, not another politician in Washington, not another social program. What this world desperately needs is a, uh, the touch of Jesus in their lives. The gospel was the power of God to change a person's life. Do you believe that today? Have you experienced that in your life? And let me ask you this, why? Why are we so hesitant to share our faith? Why are we so reserved with our neighbors? Could it be because we don't have a good grasp on the gospel? Or maybe it's the gospel doesn't have a good grasp on us. I had a former student of mine, Matt Pennington, over in Live Oak, he recently shared this with his church. He's pastor now. He said this, your understanding of the gospel affects your desire to impact lostness. I think that's a great word. The more I understand the gospel, the more I reflect on the beauty and the good news of the gospel, the more I'm reminded of that the gospel was what changed my life and made the difference in my life, the more I'm going to be aware of the needs of others around me the more my heart will yearn and be uh, challenged and, and broken over the brokenness in this world, and the more I'm going to be motivated to go out and to make a difference. And so how can we be a good neighbor? Put on your gospel glasses. Also, live your life with, mar with margin. You know, we think of margin, and margin is space, isn't it? I, I, I've, I've, many of us have been through school. I'm still doing school, and I'm still writing. Now, they're very specific with margin size, but you know what some people will do? If, if the teacher doesn't tell you how big the margin is, what do they do? They widen it up because it gives more spa you know, less space to have to write. And, you know, just even a, a fracture, a, a fraction of it, just a fraction bigger can make a big difference in a long paper, can it? My, my professors, they get a measuring tape out, and they'll measure those margins, right? A margin represents space. I'm afraid one of the biggest challenges facing evangelicals in the church today is we live our lives with no space. We max out our schedules to the full. We're so busy. We live at such a breakneck pace that we leave no room for the Lord to work through us. We're just running around from one thing, one chore, one errand, and one project to the next. All the while, we're in this world of brokenness, and there's people around us, maybe not stripped, maybe not beaten in a ditch, but people who are broken inside, desperate for hope, and you have the answer to that. But friends, when we just continue to press forward, leaving no space, will we become like this passing priest and this looking Levite. We're just too busy. We don't have time. There's always good excuses. Maybe not really good. There's always excuses. We have to create and leave margin for the Lord to work through us. We have to be willing to step into the ditches of life. Friend, you cannot impact lostness from a distance. You cannot impact lostness in, in the lives of people from a distance. The, the Good Samaritan teaches that he had to enter into this man's situation. He had to step out, down into the ditch where others didn't dare to go. And I love what Jesus said in, in the, the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 5. You are the salt of the earth. You think about that. You know, back in Jesus' day, salt had a lot of applications. We know it for really one good application, right? It makes things taste good. How many of y'all like... You know, some of y'all are in diets, okay? I understand that. Some of you, your doctors say, lay off the salt. That's a tough ask, isn't it? Things just don't have a lot of flavor. You said, but, you know, back in Jesus' day, it was applied in so many more ways. Salt was a healing agent. It was a cleansing agent, a purifying. Salt was to preserve things, and salt would add flavor. But here's the thing. It doesn't change anything if it doesn't make contact. Friend, I can have a salt shaker on the table, but if I never take that salt and make contact with my food, my food's going to be bland, isn't it? We have to get out and touch things in this life. And that's what Jesus is saying. You're the salt of the earth. Go and be the salt. Go into the ditches of life. Go to where people are hurting and where they are struggling. Be the salt of the earth. I believe that Jesus has placed us as a church, placed me as a follower of Christ, and you here in this community, in this day, in this age, for a purpose. To reach this community, to reach our state, to reach our schools, your workplaces, your places, 
uh, that you go about in your random day to the gym. He's placed us here to reach people with the good news of the gospel. But friend, we can never reach a people we don't make contact with. Know this, you may not be able to meet every need. You may not be able to meet every need, but there are some things you can do. You can offer a helping hand. You can be a sympathetic ear. You can be a source of godly counsel. You can be a compassionate friend. You can share Jesus what they really need, but you can't do it from a distance. We have to be there. And lastly, and I'll be quick here, you have to be willing to pay the cost. You have to be willing to pay the cost. It costs us something to be a good neighbor, doesn't it? The Good Samaritan teaches us it costs us time. It costs us energy. Sometimes it'll cost us resources, and it may even cost your life. I read a story of John Getty in the 1840s. He left the pastorate of a church in Canada to take his wife and his two small children to the South Sea Islands to begin a mission there. After a voyage of 20,000 miles, they arrived in the, the new Hebrides Islands at Eneatum. The island chain was filled with cannibals. And just months before their arrival, 20 crew members of a British ship had been killed. And the cannibals ate them. This didn't deter Giddies from their mission as they believed that God had called them to this people and for this work. They just simply went in faith. As they got there and they began to establish their family and they began to share the gospel, it began a slow work. Few by few were coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But soon it built momentum. Soon they began to reach this island. He would continue his ministry faithfully. He would translate the Bible into their language. He would plant 25 churches. He would impact this island for Christ. All the while there was this threat, this constant threat to his family's life. But God called him there for purpose. In the pulpit of that church where he pastored so many years, there's a plaque in his honor which says this, When he landed in 1848, there were no Christians here. And when he left in 1872, there were no heathen. All because one man answered the call to be a good neighbor, to go into all corners of this world, to share the good news that Jesus saves You ask, what does it mean to be a good neighbor? We learn from the Good Samaritan. We learn from men and women who went before us, such as John Getty. A good neighbor is someone who genuinely cares, whose life has been transformed by the power of the gospel, and a person who has a heart to reach the lost, who is willing to pay the cost. May I ask, as we wrap up today, how are you neighboring? How are you neighboring? Will you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for the privilege to come into your presence and to look to your word today. Lord, this is our worship to you, to open our hearts. Lord, to listen to that still, small voice as you speak to us through your word. Lord, I I stand before you and before this congregation as one who is not always a good neighbor. Lord, I confess and I repent that too often I get so busy in life. Father, too often I just miss those that you place in my path. Lord, I pray that today, Lord, you would just open my eyes, open our eyes to see the needs around us. Lord, give us a gospel view in this world, Lord. Understand the worth of every life, the problems that truly ail this world, and the solution, Lord, the answer that we know is Jesus Christ. Convict our hearts to go. Lord, I pray that you would use us in this day to make a difference in this community, to reach out to the hurt, to the broken, to reach them for your glory. And as we do, Father, may you be honored. May you be glorified. Lord, may you receive all the glory. It's in your name I pray. Amen. As we go into a time.